Summer came early, Radical Ones. Welcome to the Summer of the Dead. Each week, we will be reviewing a new zombie movie or movies that give you those zombie feels. Our first movie is the remake done by Tom Savini, Night of the Living Dead, 1990, based on George Romero's classic zombie film. It's time to get radical. <laughs> Ensure all residences are secure with all doors and windows firmly locked and barricaded. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Not people. Brains. They're us. We're them. They're us. Oh my god. You are dead. No, no. no. The pain of being dead. Were you bitten? No. Were you bitten? Did any of the blood get in your mouth? They have overrun us, you know. We're in the minority now. Something like 400,000 to one by my calculation. Your father, my father, always say, when the earth spit out the dead, they will come back to suck the blood from the living. When there is no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. There's another one for the fire. Hey Radical Ones, welcome to an all new episode of the Radical Retro Rewind Podcast and the Summer of the Dead. As always, I am your host, Radical Ryan Hunter, and I am joined by everyone's favorite brother and mine, David, for our review and conversation on Night of the Living Dead 1990. Welcome, David. Hi! This is the remake of George Romero's classic movie, actually directed by Tom Savini. What are your feelings about the original Night of the Living Dead and this remake? Do you prefer one over the other one? Do you kind of just look at them as sister movies in a way? Are they parallel? I actually really like the remake for many reasons. They're both, to me, a standalone film. Like, the reason being is, yes, this premise is still there very much. There's, there's, they kind of mirror each other. If you were to, like, have a, a magic mirror and one side of the mirror was, was 1950 and the other side of the mirror was 1990, I guess you would say. The more that we've been going back and throughout this whole summer where we're reviewing and going back over these movies, you know, it's from a different perspective. So when you're doing a podcast, if you're doing a what I consider to be a quality podcast or a good podcast, podcast you start looking at things a little bit differently than the just the entertainment value you, you make little notes in your head you might even make notes on your phone you go oh my god i never thought about that before i kind of looked at these movies in a different way maybe with new eyes so all the movies that we're all the movies really for the podcast that we've done or we're doing you know i i look at them a little bit differently than i did the first time or the second time i saw them night of the living dead 1990 i rarely see it's not something that's ever shown on regular television it's not something yeah. that is up there i don't know Know why because i for the cinematic value and everything was good budget and and i liked it so i don't know so my thoughts are i both stand alone i like some of the changes in the the newer adaptation of it i think david says it perfectly it is two sides of a of a coin and i have to say i think in remakes this is what i want in a remake because it stays so true to the original one with the characters the theme and the plot but it might modernized it enough and added enough twists and changes that it kept the story the same but also changed it enough to be more interesting I think. I think Tom Savini filmed a beautiful movie even just the way he lays out zombies and things like that on the field I feel like it's very artistic so I don't know if that has to do with him being a makeup artist but. No it's good it's a really good movie. It's really good. Remember when they made that remake of Psycho and they did basically just a color shot for shot dialogue was the same. It was a word for word remake. Was that with Anne Heche? Yes, the Anne Heche one, besides the picture frame uh, flapping, what they would call it, masturbation that Norman does. I think that was the only added in thing when he's watching her in the shower. But it's a basically, it was a shot for shot remake. I don't really want that in a remake, but this does it in a way that, again, it retains the integrity of the story. I'm assuming it's because George Romero worked on the script and, you know, Tom Savini being a longtime collaborator of Romero. And it doesn't reinvent 
reinvent the wheel. I agree. Talking about that, how recently Lady Gaga did A Star Is Born. So the, the third Star remake, Born. the fourth remake. No, it's like the fourth remake. You had Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson, Julie Garland and James Mason. And you had another one, which I think it was... Uh, original one, right? Original one. I think it was like in the 30s. I want to say it's Janet Gaynor? Gain? Something like that. I don't, I don't remember that one. So yeah, I think it was done. I think it was updated just enough, but it, it kept the bones. No pun intended. Well, maybe. Yes, the bones. It left the bones, which was good. Yeah. They are coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it. They are coming. <laughs> they don't like being awakened this way. <laughs> Why do you have to be so mean? Hey, I'm your older brother. Being mean and heartless is part of my job. God. <laughs> They're coming to get you, little sister. So this is siblings Barbara and Johnny visit their mother's grave in a remote Pennsylvania cemetery. During the visit, they are attacked by a zombie. Johnny is killed and Barbara flees the cemetery and discovers what appears to be an abandoned farmhouse. David, we know that the original one brought us the classic, they're coming to get you, Barbara line. So this does the same exact thing. But even this, David, is modernized in the sense that the dialogue is updated a little, but also in the original night of the living dead the first zombie that comes you know towards barbara and her brother johnny attacks them this one subverts your expectations because it's just a a stunned i guess a person who's going to turn into a zombie sh relatively sh after that kind of person and then right after that you're looking at that bam the real zombie comes and attacks johnny so even just a little that little tweak right there Oh yeah, you so you there's a few things that I would like to say with this. So you have the classic that come and get you, Barbara, but then the the brother's like, and they're horny, Barbara. They haven't had <laughs> sex in a long, long time, Barbara. Something ridiculous like that. They need it bad, Barbara. Something stupid. <laughs> like it's something ridiculous. And she's like, Stop it, Johnny. And they're arguing about their mother, why even in death she has to inconvenience them and be rude because she has to be buried out in the middle of freaking nowhere. You're afraid, aren't you? You really are afraid of this place. God, you never stop. <laughs> Love of God, Johnny. Bastard! Jesus, you're weird. Let's just get through this, can we please? Just get it over with. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Barbara. For the love of God, Johnny. They're horny, Barbara. They've been dead a long time. Look. Look, there's one of them now. So you have that, which is much more realistic, I think, for a lot of people. <laughs> And then you do, I think that guy was actually, so there's a scene where Dick, you just described, I think that man is the hearse driver. The oh, guy is that, that initially the one comes, who's driving the hearse? Oh, I think yes, because we see an I think he hearse. was the mortician or a hearse driver, and I think that's when the zombie comes out. I don't, he, I think he was attacked, and I think he was startled and stunned and shocked, and he's now wandering until maybe he does turn into a zombie. <laughs> Johnny! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, I'm sorry. Hey, man, are you okay? Is there something we can do to help? I would say that I definitely love this. And the other thing that I thought about, I don't know why you're thinking about it for years. There's two zombies then coming for Barbara after after her brother gets killed by one of the zombies. She takes the the metal thing that holds up the cross or the wreath on the thing. She stabs the zombie yeah. with it. Nothing happens. Then you see another guy walking. She's like, help me, help me, help. And you see him walk and all of a sudden you see his clothes start to fall down. Yes. And I always think about this. His, his suit was cut down the back of 
of it because I guess apparently when you're obviously when you're a dead body, they don't they just kind of stop. I'm assuming that's what happens. That must be true because if Savini did it or one of you know, I think they would keep it true to real life. Matter of fact, that's in the commentary, David. Yes, he actually says that that that's what they do. They leave it open on the back and they yeah. So that's supposed to be I'm assuming the zombie that was just in that coffin that's left open. Yeah, I would imagine so. Great reveal too because he's slowly walking towards her and the like David said the suit falls down like a one piece and you reveal his chest was sewn up but damn it's brutal because that zombie is also attacking her at the same time from the car on the other side and the classics johnny had the keys in his course pocket and then she runs to the farm where you definitely love this the whole thing you know you see her running she well that running david patricia tallman who plays barbara in this movie she and i remember this because again i was a weirdo i used to watch the dvd commentary before high school started like i was getting ready in the morning and i remember listening to tom zavini telling these little facts and he said that she had basically no shoes on because she loses her shoes in the cemetery and she does that run up into a point when she she stops and there's like hay around her. I don't know if you noticed this before the farmhouse. She stops for a minute and she's actually slipping into shoes off camera so they don't cut and she could just have shoes on and, and run the rest of the way without damaging her bare feet. So that's a little behind the scenes magic. Now that we're talking about Barbara, we get the 90s equivalent of Barbara in this movie. The original one, of course, becomes canatonic, just basically there to be the damsel in distress. So this is again a modern update. But I don't want to say that the original Barbara was too much of a just a bland character because we've seen in just what we've gone through with COVID, David, that people lose their mind. So I kind of understand why the original Barbara in the movie became this canatonic. Maybe, yes, it was a cliched character for the time, but that is a possibility. I do love this new modern gunslinger Barbara that kind of wakes up. You know, she starts that way, but then she wakes up, which is another change. She's like the Linda Hamilton from Terminator, right? Yeah. She's like, she, yep. she starts, yep. and I love that about, that's one of the things I did like about this character and this update because I I honestly, you know, we kind of say that she gets a little, she loses her mind a little bit too. <laughs> In a great but, way, though. <laughs> but it propels her to survive. And she's actually the voice of reason throughout this movie in many ways, too. So, definitely. So, she gets to the farmhouse. And I always think that the Dawn of the Dead remake took this from there. Because do you remember that bloated zombie in the Dawn of the Dead remake? And how that character, Anna, hits them with the fire poker? Doesn't oh, yeah, this yeah, kind of yes, yes, yes. remind you of this zombie? Because when Barbara gets to the farmhouse, she is attacked by the, the zombified residents. And there is that larger uncle that falls down on top of her and she beats the hell out of him with a fireplace poker. I don't know if it's just if that was supposed to be homage, but totally reminds me of Dawn of the Dead 04, how they they did that. Like, meaning they copied it from this movie. They're, 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 all these zombie movies, unless you're the original, all these zombie movies are incestuous and related and, and picked apart and reused. And there is something to be said, though. If you have a fireplace and you have a heavy-duty poker, I mean, even as kids, I remember, you know, being told, don't touch those because you could hurt yourself. You know, they're heavy, they're pointy. You know, you could really hurt somebody. I mean, a fireplace poker is actually a really really great weapon to grab when you're kind of cornered because it doesn't break it doesn't bend it's heavy enough to you know even with use of gravity going towards somebody but it's not too heavy that you can't pick it up and use it mm, so. there you go patricia tolman i have to say i really like her as barbara i, oh, I think really she does like a phenomenal what she job did. i mean wasn't she was also in one of the star treks and babylon 5 and babylon 5 star trek the next generation she's also on deep space 9 and Voyager. Oh, wow. So she was really... And also she was in other George Romero's original films, including Knight Riders, Monkey Shines, and Creep Show 2, in which she performed stunts because she also does stunts. That's awesome. I love what she brings to this role when she does become, like you're saying, the Sarah Connor, Barbara. Her famous line of, we could walk right past them. They're so slow. We could just walk right past him. We wouldn't even have to run. We could just walk right past him. How she's able to really just take control by the end when everyone is freaking out. And, you know, we get level-headed Ben, which another great performance. Tony Todd as Ben. What do you think about him? This man, you he, I feel like he could look at you and just start crying. And you believe it. <laughs> 
Some of those things made it inside the diner. Started coming after us. Some good old boy comes chasing him. Mean son of a bitch got some kind of hot shit gun like an M16 or something. He starts shooting well. Bullets tearing up the place. I saw one of those things take 30 hits and keep on coming. The damn thing had to be dead, but it kept on coming. Till it took a hit in the head. That brought it down. The only way to stop him, you gotta, you gotta... Get him in the head. Look, I don't know what's going on. But I sure as hell know that it ain't no prison break. It ain't no kind of chemical that I ever heard about can make a dead man walk. This is something that nobody has ever heard about and nobody's ever seen before. This is hell on earth. This is pure hell on earth. I think he's a great actor. I think that he definitely, again, added something to the character from the from the original movie that the original movie didn't have. Well, Ben, in both movies, are the voice of reason, so I will say that. But I, but uh, do you really feel Ben was the voice of reason? Because I'm going to tell you something. After seeing this movie again, I'm going to challenge you on that. Well, actually, that was one of my questions for you. Was Cooper right all along? Because the big thing in this movie is, and we're assuming radical ones that you probably heard of this movie or at least the original one and there's this clash of staying in the basement as verse of staying upstairs so my question to you then was gonna be was cooper right was being in the basement safer because evidently ben survived overnight in this version because he did stay in the basement (laughs) damn and the keys were down there too you have cooper and you have ben who are polar opposites you have a white guy you have a black guy which definitely i think that they use that that, again that's a metaphor with romero from the original movie too about racism and and, and i don't know maybe i always read into things more deeply but you get the sense that cooper is strong-minded and and a a, probably a bigot and whatever to begin with or and an an a-hole in general and entitled at least in this new movie ben is not going to sit there and take any of his crap oh what you trying to figure out if somebody's got a car you don't think we've been through all this before Mine is broken down on the interstate, and the kid here doesn't own one, if you can believe that. Damn. What about you, Mr. Ben? You don't exactly look like neighbors yourself. Truck. Outside, out of gas. Gas? Evan City is five miles away. We can make five miles on freaking fumes. Yeah, what if we don't make it? You're willing to take that chance? Yeah. Besides, Evan City's a war zone, man. I know, I've been there. It's gonna take us a hell of a lot more than five miles before we find any real help. But Ben also comes off as someone who has nothing else to lose as well. So he's he's not thinking always in the terms of... uh, Honestly, after seeing this movie, when I first saw this movie and my memories of this movie was Cooper was an a-hole and and probably a racist and a lot of other bad things and a wife beater and whatever else. And Well, they were both stubborn and they were both... But I have to tell you, they were equally ignorant. They put people in danger, both of them. And you could say, well, one's behavior was because of the other, but they both were back and forth and they both assumed the worst about each other from the minute they saw one another well what do you think about that tv part then did you believe that there's one part when cooper is bringing the tv down supposedly from upstairs? cooper says it you, does you look like get, he's gonna bring it it does but cooper says you can't get reception in a basement and then the tv ends up being destroyed because you know they're battling back and forth so i do see that hey damn will you take it huh Hell no, 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 that says I'm here, pal. Will you get off my back? God damn it! You damn it! God damn it! Nice doing, asshole! You smashed it! You were taking it downstairs! I was not taking it downstairs! You stupid! You... Fuck! Damn you! I have to 
to say to the racism part, David, of course, originally going into this, I always thought that. But I will say, I think it is a lot that this character really just is an asshole. He comes up very entitled. You know, he's basically treating these people like they're hicks from the sticks because they don't have all have cars and they don't have this and they don't have that. Right, well, what, well right. what are you doing in the middle of nowhere to begin with? You had to have been pretty far away to begin with when this whole thing happened unless you were fleeing someplace you were look like you came from a wedding a party or something yeah, yeah it looks like based on what helen was dressed like and the daughter and and him as well looks like yeah they were on the way or back from somewhere maybe i don't want to read too much into it only because i just want to look at it purely from an entertainment standpoint but at the same time th- th- definitely there's tensions between these characters definitely there's assumptions but ultimately it's a it's a do we go into the basement and have no place to escape from if they get through or do we try to fight it out and try to have an escape route in case we need to flee pretty easily and my thing is hannah montana it have the best of both worlds (laughs) both worlds they should have all gotten together and fortified the house the windows including which they didn't do putting furniture in front of the windows as well right along with the wood which i would have put every piece of furniture and block all the windows and all the accesses with as much things as possible as opposed to just hammering stuff in i can tell you right now i have no place to hammer anything if someone's going to break through my window i don't have i don't i don't don't have i don't have woodwork i just have around it nothing so i wouldn't be able to do that anyway but i sure would put heavy tables and furniture and wood things in front of areas if i could well they they were using some of the tables as scrap wood so i could see that but you're right they did have couches bookcases couches sofa did they show basically that the hammering was attracting the zombies as well was this actually a deterrent like i get it i mean i think it's smart this is of course the movie where we the original where we get boarding up the windows of zombies come but it feels like like this lord all the zombies to them it did i mean and they're banging every, continuously and having every flipping light on in the house yes the lights too yes first of all the first thing you should do is make sure everything's locked make sure all the curtains yes. are drawn have enough light that you can look and find things but not have enough where you're the only beacon of light for for miles to see it's like being attracted to a lighthouse <laughs> right they're getting the light and they're getting the banging which we saw in, in movies like dawn of the dead that that's what to get the zombies to come they're they're attracted to sound and things like that Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! come on let's go over here <laughs> you did all right this time fly boy how about it <laughs> So then this goes against Ben's idea as well then. So this actually caused the zombies to come then, in a way. Well, in a way it did, but also some of the zombies were drawn because the zombies at Barbara, they were like following her no matter what. My God, and she does, I gotta say, she takes on a whole army of houses before Ben comes. And what do you think about this, David? Ben pulls up and we get a shot of him and he comes out, it's a um, crowbar. It comes down like a hook. And then two years after this, Tony Todd plays the camera. Candyman with the hook. I just thought that was a little funny thing. It's like almost like it foreshadowed him in a horror movie because this was his first horror movie. He helps Barbara and, and takes out some of the rest of the zombies, but she was doing damn good. But at the end of this, we saw that the safest wasn't probably even the basement, which it ended up lasting, but there was a ceiling attic, which would have been the best, the best really safe way to hide away from the zombies because the zombies would have never gotten up into the attic. Too bad they didn't know that originally. Well, the, here's the thing. In any of these movies, there's no way to predict timing. And that what I say about this is, so let's say, let's say the zombie apocalypse really happened, okay? But we knew that we were going to be rescued in three days. Right. I have an attic. I have an attic, but I also live in a very hot climate. But could you possibly make it work and survive and hide in the attic? Yeah, it's big enough. It would be a horrible experience, but to survive being eaten alive, I would do it. However, what if they didn't come and then you, you let zombies into the house? My point was... They should have fortified right. the house to keep the zombies out, go to the basement as the last resort because they didn't realize 
there was an addict and deal with it that way. But they didn't. So, I mean, that's what it comes down to. That's what I mean about best of both worlds. I would have piled up everything. I would have taken furniture from upstairs. Scooby and put, dooed it. You would have Scooby dooed. Yeah, I would have put door. dressers and everything else. But anything would have been a turn. Like, okay, so like in 28 days later, when they pile up all the, the grocery carts in front of the thing. Shopping trolley. You're telling me that's a deterrent. That's obviously a deterrent for them to be able to crawl and get in. It doesn't mean it's 100%, but anything's yes, got to help. Yes. Especially these zombies because they're very slow and uncoordinated. So, yes, I definitely would have, have done both. Some other trivia before we get more into discussion is Romero said that the remake came about in part of issues over profits of the original film. A lengthy court battle over the rights of the film, plus an oversight that caused the copyright notice not to be included, caused Romero to see little in the way of profit. Romero's production company, Image 10, eventually won the lawsuit, but the distributor went out of business before they could collect any money. Oh, Damn. Joy. So the other issue was the fact that the filmmakers were worried that someone else might make an unauthorized remake which oh romero my god if you only saw this 50 different night of the living deads out there now they heard that 20th century film corporation was interested in a remake and romero russo and steiner who worked on the original movie 20 years earlier savini was initially hired to perform a special effects but was persuaded to direct by romero and Servini was drawn to the remake because he was unavailable to do the special effects on the original one. I remember this because he was at um, in the war at the time. And then he got to do Dawn and Day's effects. And then Savini described this as being the worst nightmare of his life. He said that 40% of his ideas only made it into the final film. When Romero was on set, he clashed with producers who did not allow him to explore his vision of the film. And he originally wanted it to start in black and white and slowly add color so much like a wizard of oz effect also bill cardill who was a reporter in both the 1968 version makes an appearance in this and he is the father of sarah from day of the dead little he loves to keep those connections romero russ steiner who appeared in the original night of the living dead as johnny appears as the sheriff at the end of this movie who says yeah they're dead they're all messed up tell me chief are these little things warm over there. yeah they're Here's dead warm. they're all messed up Really this was really interesting, David. This was one of my favorite things. And I remember on the commentary, Tom Savini stating this, but when the characters take refuge in the isolated farmhouse, next to the doors, visible in shots of the exterior of the house is the name M. Celeste in script font. This is a homage to the ship, the Mary Celeste, which was discovered in the Atlantic Ocean unmanned and under sail, headed towards some place in 1872. The crew was not on board, but only one lifeboat gone. The ship had no damage and was see seen-worthy. And things, food was left on the table and things like that. So this is Savini's homage to that ship. It's much like Barbara walks in and food is left open, like something just, people just mysteriously disappeared. So I thought that was kind of cool. Remember when she walks and she turns the bacon off or whatever's cooking i'm like oh at least she turned off the she turned off the cooking bacon she's thinking at least oh my god though david i think a lot of things she does in this movie is fantastic especially the is he dead tell me is he dead when she's shooting that man that uh, judy rose says you can't do that that's Mr. That's Magruder Mr. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mr. McGregor. From, he's got Peter the Rabbit. <laughs> son, Mr. McGregor! Look at his back! You son of! Look at his back! I didn't do that! Look there! Barbara. It's like Uncle Reed. They're dead, but they're coming right for us. No. That's impossible. That just can't be. Is he dead? Ah! No! Is he dead? No! You're all seen! Is he dead? Stop it! You're losing it, girl! You are losing it! You think so? Whatever I lost, I lost a long time ago, and I do not plan on losing anything else. You can talk to me about losing it when you stop screaming at each other like a bunch of two-year-olds. <laughs> I feel like that's something you would do, too. If someone was losing their mind like Judy in this movie, I feel like you would say, is this person dead? Shoot them in a part that wouldn't kill them. Tell me, are they dead now? 
You were like, I am not standing for this shit. I'm actually, <laughs> I think, I don't know if it's because of just life in general or that I dealt with people dying and stuff like that. I'm, when I, when there's a big trauma, like something's horrible going on, I'm, I become very laser focused and I become very non, I'm, I'm good in that type of thing. I'm just always have been, I guess. That someone has to maintain some sort of rationale and calm. You can't all run around and so... Somebody's got to survive. So Ben and Barbara discover that hiding in the cellar is Harry Cooper, a selfish husband, his wife Helen, their daughter Sarah, who was bitten by a zombie and is ill, and teenage lovers Tom and Judy Rose. The group is divided over what course of action they should do. Harry believes everyone should retreat into the cellar and barricade the door and wait for the authorities. And Ben thinks the cellar is a death trap and that they would better serve fortifying the house which at least has alternate escape groups and barbara suggests that they group should simply leave the house on foot after she notices the zombies limited mobility so there you go there's actually the third point of barbara we could just walk right past them and that's exactly what she does david she does and the the, the whole thing with that is that's logical they all could have had their piece of the pie so they could have had the thought of going in the basement, fortify the house. If it became overrun, people could either have gone to the basement or left out the back door or something like that. Right, right. And and take your chances. So instead of fighting, because they spent so much time in fighting and 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 just fighting amongst themselves and arguing, and I guess it it, it is that disbelief thing. So we, we, you know, we're looking from perspective. I'll be honest with you. If tomorrow I heard on the news that the the dead were rising, I probably wouldn't even. I mean, I would be scared, but I would be like, oh, yeah, what's next, 2022? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh, God. what's what's next? You're like, I was waiting for you. Because we've seen these movies and we're almost slightly desensitized, even though it would be the most horrific thing to, to ever experience. Oh, yes. I mean, I never want to see this. <laughs> but what I'm saying is they're shocked. They're shocked because people are moving around and they have some sort of. But when you see something grotesque and things, limbs hanging off and it's mutilated, there is no way in my mind that I would think that that person's alive and or not going to harm me. I'm sorry. <laughs> like the zombie that comes in without his shirt on. He goes, because he was all shaky and loose and he. <laughs> Shake that flesh at the people. Shake it. He was that skin and bones look I've always wanted. Skin and bones green though green and dead as hell and we see that these people are dead so yeah i mean it is unbelievable of course it's easy for us to say in this situation well we would just walk right past them but since they're in this since they've gotten past the fact that this is a reality and it's happening barbara is able to do that barbara's also changed changed her clothes put on boots got out of her dress and skirt looking for weapons and ammunition she's be, she's on autopilot too like even hammer, hammering stuff she's she's yeah. ready she, she's ready to go she's ready to run she thinks this is the best option and she's prepping because she even looks around she's trying to see like what yeah. <laughs> yeah. she's willing to she's willing to play ball with the with the rest of the team but ultimately her goal is i think the best thing is to get out of here take my chances they're spread out. Do you like when she opens the door at that one point when they're all freaking out to find the keys? And she's like, is that your uncle's body right out there? So could he possibly have the keys? Another smart move. Like, she's not worried about opening the door because she realizes that I guess she could maybe possibly take some of these things out. And she thought of that, which was great. So, David, before we get past that, do you think the part of her putting on pants was a metaphor? Or am I reading too much into that moment? Like, Barbara, the old by... Barbara, was in a dress. And then the fact that she, this Barbara takes the dress off and puts the pants on. Is it almost like, well, now look, Barbara's wearing the pants in this version? Literally. I think it could, I think it could be both. I think that she realizes, the character realizes that she's not going to make it going through woods and stuff too well with a skirt on. She's going to protect her legs and her body. It might be cold outside. You know, there's pockets in there if she wants to put bullets in it. I think it's a metaphor. I yeah. think it just shows that she's a strong character and she's smart about it. Like, I wouldn't have on shorts if I was going to have to make a trek through the woods you would want to protect your your body and everything else so i think it, it, it is a metaphor but it's also just the fact that she's thinking which is more than i could say for some of the other characters who seem to be still in a daze over you know you there's there's a part where you have to accept what's going on like there's stuff seen we've seen in this world like with covid and ri rioting and stuff and different things that we've seen that we would have never thought you know would have been 
but once you saw it you need to accept that it did happen like you have to be like okay now i have to survive this somehow or do my best to so yeah to me she was my favorite character thus far in the whole thing the whole series i agree i mean helen was likable in the sense that and this is cooper's wife yes she was screaming about you know helping the daughter of course who was injured but she out of all of them even in the original one she cared for the other people because even when they go for the gas and that whole scene where tom shoots the gas pump i I don't know but anyway she says we have to wait for ben so she's at least worrying about ben coming back too so i always like that with helen and that actress she's got a voice like that we can't do this we can't do it harry we're going up we've got to get help for sarah i'm not opening that door helen and neither are you and if you try so help me out you what what is your daughter lying there we have got to get her to a doctor There's no doctors upstairs, Helen, and there's no way out of here! (laughs) But I like that she cared about other people in this situation. So it does show where her heart was, although it doesn't help any of them. So I will give that to her. Did Judy get the Barbara treatment in this version, though? Judy is the girlfriend. She kind of goes into that shock. This is Judy Rose. Judy, we'll get them old shelves out of the kitchen. What are we doing now? We're going to board up them windows. Tell me! Board up the windows! Are you sure we're gonna be alright? There are more than things out there, more than things like Uncle Reed. Tommy! Come on, do what I tell ya! In the original one, she kind of just, I always remember her just being like, oh, I'm here, I'm like 60s girl. Like, I'm a, like, She I'm did there. look like she was like, she, she the, the, the actress does look like she would be like in Barbarella or something, just dancing. Yes, like yeah, exactly, exactly. So she kind of was just like a bland character in the original one. I think this one kind of got the Barbara treatment of, like, she goes crazy in the car driving for a minute, but then she's like, oh, I didn't hear you. I lost Ben when Ben falls out, but they show her driving almost like raw or in Dawn of the Dead when he lost his mind in the truck. I don't know. That's just an observation. So we see that Sarah, the daughter, comes alive and kills Helen. And she doesn't use the the pick like she did in the original one, but they kind of have that homage when she kills the mother. It splats and it's that cement pick on the wall. Because I remember the, the zombie used that to kill them. Yeah, a trowel, yes. So she dies in the basement. Harry goes down into the basement while this is whole going on when Ben is trying to come back and Judy and Tom are burnt to a crisp. And those zombies did get to eat a meal that was at least cooked. Cooked, barbecue. Ooh. And they just drag those bodies out. They show it too. Ooh, those charred bodies. There's an attempt because Ben does have a truck and they could possibly get away with the truck, but they need gas. They they make a plan to try to find the gas key to the, the gas gas pump that's locked up which barbara also passes that gas pump unfortunately it, things go awry they, they don't have the right set of keys and instead instead of just giving it up and going back he shoots the lock which makes the whole the gas tank explode he has a torch right next to him i mean it's in the truck that thing was on i mean fire. and and he and he didn't try to take the gas pump for a, a memento yeah <laughs> yeah listen to our dawn of the dead st- podcast for that one so you see where ben is making his way back to the house and trying to get in in the meantime cooper is attacking barbara trying to get the gun away from her and barbara's trying to shoot the zombies which she's doing with quite good accuracy amazing accuracy to keep you trying to keep them off of ben ben is trying to break in because cooper's holding barbara and won't let her open the door So then finally, you have a part where Ben gets in, and then it becomes a shooting match between Ben and Cooper shooting at each other and wounding each other. Because he wants to, Ben sees that Sarah, the daughter, is dead a zombie, and Cooper doesn't want him to shoot her, too, as well. Yes, yes. They end up shooting each other. And then you have a point where Cooper runs up the the stairs, and you see that Ben is crawling, and zombies are getting in, and Barbara is torn because she wants, she's like, come on, we can go now, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna, and he's like, I'm too hurt to go so then you see barbara you know she she's beside herself but she realizes that she has to survive so she goes and ben makes his way to the basement where he never wanted to be lights a cigarette finds the the gas pump key that's just on the wall it says gas pump key and unfortunately (laughs) because i mean there's other parts of the movie where they find out that the that the uncle is was redoing the house so the doors were crappy doors and all the doors were down the basement and cooper wouldn't let them in to get the doors and then there's a of comment because the daughter because the daughter is laying on top of a door and he's like, You want this one too? So there's definitely this heated interaction. And unfortunately, I'm I'm seeing that more and more people, especially if COVID taught me anything, more and more people 
do not do well in bad under situations. pressure I, no, of any kind totally of any happened. kind so i would have to say i don't think i would trust too many people if this was happening i'd have to be like fend for myself and keep away i don't know how i would i would I, I mean i like my neighbors but i don't know who i would trust because people you don't know their- your neighbors in the time of crisis that's true. People become very different in the time of crisis. There's a few things that I wanted to mention. One, if they had boarded up the house and all agreed to go into the basement, there was a very large piano next to the, the basement door. They could have slid the piano over the entrance to the basement oh, door. Oh, right, enough, and then kind of squeeze behind it, and then, like, kind of, yeah, totally, totally. Even if they, listen, they had someone push it, and the person crawled over, and they helped the person over the piano, they could have pushed this heavy piano in Smart. front of the door. Smart. Smart, because the zombies are not going to be using tools, right? They're just going to be trying to push against it. Yeah. I well, the zombies that. aren't even going to realize that the piano is there to block them. It may just be, they just, no. just walk around it. Okay, that's exactly. one thing. Exactly. Exactly. Great point. Would have done that. Would have completely done that. And they should have brought some supplies down to the basement if that's where they were going to go with. Because again, you don't know how long they were going to be there. So I would have done that. I would have used that as the last resort. However, obviously things didn't go that way. So you see Barbara going into the lion's den, so to speak, passing the zombies. And there's some nasty ones. That little one with the baby girl doll. That's like... We always love that too because... (laughs) She just pushes her away, and then she's, you know, she doesn't want to shoot her. And then Barbara, after she does shoot her, she, again, she does this so good. You feel that she's, like, losing her mind that she has to do this. She goes, oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. And then you the see the fact that these it. zombies, these zombies will eat mice, bugs, rodents, oh, rats. Yeah, yeah. It's so like these the are the original type, one. They would eat the bugs. These are the zombies that will eat the dogs too and stuff. Like in in the the remake of Dawn, yeah, of Dawn of the Dead, the chips, chips, chips was able to walk I right through the zombies because they don't. They, that. Nobody cared about poor chips. I love chips. Chips was cute. I mean, Chips was beautiful. By the way, David, Ving Rhames. Ving Rhames was considered for Ben. 14 years later, he was cast in the remake of George Romero's Dawn of the Dead. And then the Day of the Dead remake as well. So then you see Barbara comes across a group much like the original movie. But David, like the Dawn of the Dead, I don't want to call them hicks, but the people. They're scary rednecks that are the typical stereotype. We're not, you know what I mean? Like people have misconceptions because you listen to country music that you're from hick from the sticks we've come a long way in life i mean not every person i I listen to country you know if you think that you're you know but these are the quintessential stereotype of rednecks they're like they're shooting and they don't care they're probably eating possum pie whatever you know that kind of like stereotype so they come across that she says don't shoot don't shoot and they're like hey pretty lady what are you doing out here by yourself without like without a man and she bumps the one grabs her and she hits him and he gives her the eyes he goes Ooh. but he they could see that she ain't putting up with this shit but you also realize that again they want her to be the victim that needs help from these men and then she She's not. Right. She doesn't fit in. So again, there's also talking about stereotypes, sexism, feminism. That different. Th- that's also included. I know a lot of people probably don't read into these when they look at these movies, but I do because I think that was part of Romero's message. Having read about him and knowing what he stood for, and like you said, not big government, different things. I believe this is is definitely his perspective. And then we get a scene where they have this roundup in the fields where they're crowding zombies, they're hanging them, they're shooting them. We have a helicopter that flies over. And it was said that this was a possible homage for Tom Savini saying that's the helicopter from Dawn and this is the scene where that song is playing cause I'm a man, cause I'm a man. They're shooting the zombies when our gang is flying past. There's even like a food truck, a food truck serving some Yes, there was. Good for them, right? How we've come a long way. You see zombies. <laughs> you see zombies like in a makeshift pen fighting, very much like Land of the Dead, where Land they they the put d- a, yep. that, that woman in with zombies. You see, really like these quote unquote rednecks, really having a, a a good time, hooting and hollering, as some one of my neighbors might say. Because Barbara says having a good time, and they go. Are you kidding me? I, I never got that. Like, is that supposed I to be I never like, got that either. I was going to ask you this. Or are you kidding me? Like, ugh. Having fun. Give me a break. 
<laughs> I wanted to ask you about that. That's the one thing in the movie that I don't get. Because they almost seem like they're disgusted by her. Yeah, like she goes having a good time like she's like trying to like relate to them but not, or talk down to what they're doing i don't get it either and then she play, radical ones if you could decipher this for us and the guy goes are you kidding but he doesn't say it in a way of are you kidding me like we're having great time he looks like he's disgusted i, I don't get it so she brings them back to the farmhouse in the morning yes night has broken and dawn is here and you see like they're pulling out zombies they're burning them they're burning the bodies and you see like the that original one the fire that they have a pile of in the fire there's men that go into the farmhouse they see her with the two main guys that that were the original ones the ones that disgusted with her <laughs> they are chainsawing the wood that went that they put a so that just shows you that it would have taken a chainsaw to break the wood down in the basement then to break down that door so the zombies didn't break down the door so yes so I guess there was something to that. Zombified Ben because he died of his wounds. Wounds overnight comes out, which is different. I'm glad, David, that they don't give him the Ben just accidentally surviving the night and then getting killed in the morning in the original one. That was a, not that this isn't a downer, but that was really a downer because he made yeah. it through the whole night and he ends up being killed. But then Harry Cooper comes down the stairs and says to Barbara, you came back. You came back. Boom. She shoots him right in the head and says, it's another one for the fire. <laughs> came back. You came back. It's another one for the fire. Damn, 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 damn. Now, did they question her? Look like, damn, she just shot a real person? Or did... They Again, right? Didn't the people look disgusted and they didn't trust her? Again, these people look like that she just killed somebody. And they should have liked it the way they, they portray this group. They should have been like, damn, this woman's crazy. <laughs> we love it. But maybe maybe he's also saying that your perception of these people is not. Maybe this is just them making the best of a of a horrible time, you know? <laughs> bad, like, you yeah, know. a bad situation. <laughs> they may have customs and traditions that we're not used to. I, and I would never fault somebody because honestly, in situations like this, yes, maybe I don't want someone with a small mind to cut round and shoot me. But we do need people, I think, who are willing to do this and take up arms to defend other people. The biggest issue is the fact that they were stringing people up and shooting bodies yes. while they were hanging from a tree and they were corralling them if you're you know they're dead you know that they're in danger just shoot them and move on that's that's where it becomes convoluted and becomes you know what are you doing you know what i would not think anything of my neighbors shooting every zombie but when they start putting them in like a kiddie pool and like letting them play around <laughs> yeah. with the you know, like they're, they're to me that's where you where you draw the line like you would not i would not first of all it's dangerous because they could end up biting somebody or hurting he would be like mike why are why are the the hendersons tying those zombies to the cactuses outside <laughs> yeah like i don't get it like i don't get it and i think that that is where it they are villainized you know what just because someone's different than you doesn't mean that they're bad however the mentality if they put you in harm's way is another story so yeah and then there's this thing at the end, which totally freaked, freaks you out a little bit. Like it traumatizes. Oh, the a music bit. and the, the black and white pictures and still yeah, frames. Yeah, the image, the imagery and still frames with the music. It's like very disturbing. Well, the pictures, David, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you get the idea of almost like a crime scene pictures? Like they're do someone's documenting these? Well, I, I didn't want to really, I, not that I didn't really want to say it, but I wasn't sure where they were. I think they were drawing a parallel between lynching of black mm -hmm. people in the South. Uh, yeah, with, well, especially with, with, with those zombies were up on but but i don't think the zombies were any of any nationality no, they or were, anything like that they looked like they were gray <laughs> they were drawing the conclusion that these people this is their they're inbred they're right. they're th this is their way and they would probably do that which is much what i thought in the original i thought he got shot because he was black and they didn't care i do think that that's what was part of it but i will say that was implied that was implied again i'm not a political person i am not trying to make this a political statement i be believe that george romero though definitely has embedded in all of his movies there is there is definitely things 
that are you know what though i think the movie the version of ben though in the original one because romero even says that that wasn't written for a african-american actor it was just given to the best actor there was and it happened to be so i do which i love which i love that that he picked the best that is the way all casting should be unless you're looking for something very particular but i do see think after the fact though is when he decided with dawn day and these other movies to really go more with the messaging i wonder i wonder my thing with the the people at the end with the they're us and they're them kind of thing i actually believe david them hanging the zombies and doing this and shooting them i'm not shocked about i could actually believe this happening because there's people that do animal dog fighting you know they use actual living breathing animals and, and torture them to, to to fight with each other so i can totally picture if this happened people doing this to zombies or the people that already wanted to do murder people would have a field day i'm sure i mean i don't want to go too deep and dark it's like the things, purge but... it's like the purge yeah could you could shoot your your husband that you hate so much and be like oh he was he was a zombie because once they find the body he would already be decayed he tried to bite me i thought he was making love to you i don't care <laughs> i told him never again yeah, I saw them the last time. I was fighting him and he fell into my knife. He fell into my knife 17 times. The he cell block tango. He had it coming. He had it coming all along. Now he's a zombie. Now he's a zombie. A freaking zombie. <laughs> and like we talked about a dirty shame a, a few months ago, David, these people are out there. The people that would hang the zombies and, and beat them up and, and torture them. I wouldn't even neighbors. think to take the time to do that because I I want them dead and gone and move on because the more zombies you take out, the more, less likely you are to be fed upon and other people are fed upon. That was the whole point of this. You're right. Like to me You're was right. to start round Rounding up the infected, so to speak. Well, by the end of the original one, David, right? That was the thing. It looked like almost like they had a, a, a handle on the situation, right? Because they were just killing the, the small zombies that there were. So it makes sense that if you start when there's less and just take them out as they go, you would think, but... I wonder what that would be like in society. What if that's really happens? Would you, would every hospital room have like a drill thing to shoot the person in the head immediately to make sure like they don't come back? Would that be like practice? Like somehow like you, you, you know, once the person is pronounced dead, they would flatline. Yeah. They, they would do something in the head, like pop them in the head. And then you'd have to worry about people who die on their own or would they prematurely put, like, right yeah yeah or would they put like monitors on everybody's bodies like they talk about microchipping people to monitor their vitals to make sure they're alive for your own good david that's always a good point too and we definitely should get more into this conversation when we discuss more zombie movies but yeah what happened to the normal person that if you're in romero's world just the unburied dead die so if you're sleeping next to your if you're in the mall and you're next to Flyboy and he has a heart attack and you're fran the zombie would just kill you in the middle of the night eat you mm -hmm. that is something to think about well david your feelings about night of the living dead so all in all you enjoyed the remake would you watch it over the original one or do you like both of them existing i mean not of course we're not erasing the original one by any means that's what inspired this whole genre i would let i would probably watch the because I've seen the original so many times, and to me, it's become almost like that. Oh, it's it's Halloween. It's time to watch Night of the Living Dead. Oh, the yeah, yeah. I would yes. probably watch the remake over it in the sense of I'd be more apt to seek it out because it's been so difficult to, to find. You have to pay for it, basically, to get it now. I think I may even have it. I don't know. I have to still have to get through my CDs, my DVDs. Um, I do have books of CDs, though. Yeah, you do. A lot. But yeah, I think I would probably watch the remake more than I would watch the original because the original is... We do things like... I. It's kind of ritualistic now. The original I watch like every Halloween time. Every Halloween. You know, just like we watch our sa favorite Sailor Moon, Hearts and Ice, right before Christmas. Yeah, it's around Christmas. Yeah. It's like, it's like exactly. when I was... Exactly. We used to watch the Ten Commandments every Easter. Free Easter. <laughs> Moses! Yeah, of Easter. Moses! <laughs> We, Which has nothing had, to do with Easter, but it still makes me feel like Easter. Like yeah. when we did Benicula for Easter. I'm so excited we're doing this because this is a genre that we've loved for years, even before the craze. 
I don't get sick of it. And I saw this one that took place in Vegas that they were supposed to do another another movie because it did so well. And they weren't expecting Army of the too. Dead, yeah. I'm waiting for that. I, I mean, honestly, I never gotten tired of Dracula. I've never gotten tired of zombie movies. I don't know what it is because they're, they're kind of all the same fundamentally, but there's yes. always some kind of twist and change. And like when we did our top vampires, like I'm okay with the tortured vampires. I'm okay with glitter vampires. I'm okay with savage primal vampires. I can, I can, I can do them all. But when we go to uber fast zombies versus <laughs> slow zombies, there's going to be a little change here because this little butter ball right here can't be running. So we, we, I don't want no zombies like Zombieland or the remake of Dawn of the Dead coming for me. I want the slow ones that we can walk right past, Barbara. You and Amen. me Amen. You and me give together, us the, Barbara. Give us the slow ones. Yeah, give us the slow ones, please. I agree, David. I'm not sick of the zombie genre. I'm just sick of the subpar, low, low, low sci-fi you mean the Sharknados? You know, budgeted movies. The yeah, Sharknado but just version. that of zombie movies, though. Because everyone and their mother just makes one. I just wish we had more decent ones. But you know what? We got a whole summer to cover a whole bunch of zombie movies. And you could always reach the zombie hunter himself, David, at Universal Appeal 2020, all one word, and the Radical Retro Rewind Podcast, all one word on Instagram, or also on YouTube. And as always, if you would like to leave us a review or a voicemail on Anchor, we would appreciate that so much. We would play it on the show. We'll give you a shout out. We'll be back next week with another Living Dead movie as we continue the summer of the dead. (laughs) <laughs> or if I call it me waking up in the morning to get the kids to school. The true walking dead. We'll see you again next week, Radical Ones. Goodbye. Bye. Ensure all residences are secure with all doors and windows firmly locked and barricaded. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Not people. Brains. They're us. We're them. They're us. Oh my god. You are dead. No, no. no. The pain of being dead. Were you bitten? Were you bitten? Did any of the blood get in your mouth? They have overrun us, you know. We're in the minority 